Good morning. Welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church. If you would, stand as we sing Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain.
prayer your heart today that make your life his amen he's worthy of everything it's good to see you out here today I want to welcome you to lighthouse baptist church hope and trust you have had a good week and if not you're come to the right place to start this new week out right amen so glad to have each and every one of you today if you're here visiting with us we'd like to take just a moment and if you just hold up your hand we've got a special gift for each and every one of you today anybody today first time guest or visitor all right right down here in the front good to have you guys anyone else all right over here anybody in the balcony all right, well, we had a great early service today. Looking forward to what God's going to continue to do in this service. And uh, we've had a great week of ministry. Uh, All together, there were, I think, seven folks, uh, parts of four different families that joined uh, here over this last week. And uh, so we're thanking the Lord for God adding to uh, our local congregation, and we count ourselves blessed in that way. Um, then also had some great fellowships with our senior saints on Thursday, and the ladies went to a women's conference yesterday i don't know if they enjoyed the conference more or just getting away from their husbands you know for the for the i don't know no but they had a great great day i'd like to read uh, psalm 126 just as by way of opening it says when the lord turned again the captivity of zion we were like them that dream then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing then said they among the heathen the lord hath done great things for them verse 3 says the lord hath done great things for us whereof we are glad and we count ourselves blessed today and if you know the Lord Jesus Christ says, Savior, you indeed are blessed. And so it's so good to be with you this morning. Let's continue to worship here just a moment for the message. We'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Sing, Jesus paid it all. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me. It's great. 
Sierra Brian's going to come and sing a special for us. Appreciate that song this morning, Sierra, and 
Bridget. Uh, it's, good, it's so good to be with you today. First Thessalonians chapter 1, when you find your place there, I invite you to stay with me to honor God's Word. We uh, begin a series there last Sunday entitled Marks of a Healthy Church. Now, don't take this the wrong way. We're not claiming that we're a perfect church, and uh, these are uh, marks that a church in Paul's day, a uh, church at Thessalonica, they were a healthy, vibrant church, and we want to strive to be um, a church that is the same way, a healthy, vibrant, growing, and uh, as the Lord would will it. Uh, we thank the Lord for the church that we have. It's not a perfect church, but it's a progressing church. We're going the right way, and uh, well, it's not perfect, but it's a, it's a good church, and so we, we count ourselves blessed, and we want to try to follow after the principles here. First Thessalonians 1, read verses 1 to 5 this morning. It says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. Verse 5, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we count ourselves blessed to be able to come to gather together. Uh, we thank you for each and every one that's here. Lord, I pray that we could strive to be a church like the church at Thessalonica. The church, Lord, that you used Paul and Silas and Timothy to found some 19 centuries ago. Uh, Lord, that they were a church that were saved and were growing and were progressing. Uh, Lord, that they had many great traits that we want to strive to, to, to carry out as well here. God, I pray that you give us um, eyes to see your truth, that you give us ears to hear your truth, that you give us hearts, hearts that would be soft and prepared and ready, and that we would respond today and obey what it is that you called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated here today. I well, realize as uh, Paul, the apostle, was a... Uh, tool that God greatly used. What do we know about Paul? Uh, Paul didn't start out that way, did he? Paul was a persecutor of the early church, and yet as he went to Damascus to arrest and, and, and likely not only put them in prison, but probably put some of them to death, the Lord Jesus met him, and he turned from his religion, he turned from his sin, and he turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he got saved, and it was a miraculous conversion, and he wasn't the same, and then God brought him out into a desert season and uh, prepared his heart uh, then for what God was going to do with him uh, for the uh, future and remainder of his life. And then we pick up in Acts 13, and we see that as he's ministering there in Antioch, God called he and others out from that local church. And then they began the work of missions. They began to go out, not just locally, but they went out regionally and, and, and to other nations. Paul spent a, a time on at least three different missionary uh, we know in the book of Acts, we re read as it was recorded, uh, as he went to many different places. He went to, to Antioch, uh, he went to Ephesus, he went to places like uh, Philippi and, and uh, Berea and Corinth, uh, to Athens, and notably today he went to the city of Thessalonica. And Thessalonica we find, as you go back and study out Acts 17, the first 15 verses of Acts 17, uh, you could read about how this church was founded. And basically what happened was Paul and uh, S Silas here and Timothy were on this second missionary journey. They had been in Philippi. Um, they had some great things happen there. But like anywhere, when the gospel went forth, there was hostility and assault and persecution against it. And uh, they spent some time in jail. <laughs> These preachers were in jail much of the time, it seemed like, as they were in and out. And you know, the world has never been a friend to the gospel and the true Christianity. And, and so Paul went on to Thessalonica. And while he's there, he comes into the synagogue. You read in Acts 17, 2 and 3, what he would do is he'd find common ground. And to the Jews that were there, they believed what we know of as the law or the law and the prophets, the, the Old Testament or covenant there, uh, they had that in common. And so Paul would come there and he would open the scriptures and he would read and he would apply and basically point them to Jesus Christ. He would take the Old Testament as we know it and he'd preach Jesus out of it. And that's how these people were converted. And he did this for three Sabbaths, three Saturdays as we know. He went into the synagogue, which was a, basically like a, a Jewish church, if I could try to connect the dots here for you this morning. 
that took at least 10 or 10 to 12 uh, adult Jewish men, Orthodox, that would come and gather, and they would come and read, and, and it would be an assemblance like a place of worship as we know it today. So Paul would go there, and he went three consecutive Sabbaths, three consecutive times to the synagogue. He opened, he read, he alleged, he pointed them to Jesus. And the result was many, both Jews and Gentiles, were saved. A church is founded. But like anywhere, when the gospel is going forth, there were those who opposed it. And so the Jews, who didn't believe, were envious and stirred up uh, the other Jews and stirred up the city of Thessalonica and the government officials against Paul and against Silas and Timothy to the point to where they arrested Jason who housed them. And uh, the next day they let Paul and, and, and leave and he went on to the next city. He went to Berea where he received uh, a great response, on to Athens uh, for a time and they kept pressing him even everywhere he went. Long story short, Timothy comes to Athens and Timothy reports about the church and Paul's concerned. You know, how's this church doing, right? I mean, how, how much strength and stability could a church have after it had just basically been founded in a month, right? I mean, how, you know, a little fledgling little, this is like a little bird, you know, little, little wings barely can fly. What's going to happen to it? And so Paul's concerned with them. And so when Timothy comes to Athens, he says, I'm concerned, I'm grieved. And he sent word uh, through Timothy back to check on them, to confirm them, and uh, to see how they were doing, strengthen them. And then in Acts 18.5, we find that Timothy comes back to Paul while Paul was now in Corinth and reports the good nature, the steadfastness of the church at Thessalonica. Reported back that Paul, uh, our labor was not in vain. And so Paul is just elated. He is ecstatic. He is overjoyed. And so he writes this letter of 1 Thessalonians. It's called an epistle. Uh, you know, as we said last time, the epistle are the wives of the apostles. No, okay? Uh, just see if you're listening this morning, all right? The epistles were the letters that he would write back to these churches that he helped found. Thessalonica was one of them. So we pick up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 1, with Paul giving us this the marks of a healthy church is the name of our series. So this church is vibrant, healthy, growing. He's wanting to commend them for the things they're doing well. He's wanting to encourage them to press on. He's wanting to address a few things, as we'll see later in this five-chapter epistle. But he's also commending them to the Lord that's going to come for them. Each chapter concludes with the promise of the return of the Lord. So we pick up in verse number one and with these words. And we're talking about the marks of a healthy church. You say, well, how do I know a good church, right? You know, America has over 300,000 churches. You say, well, how do I know a good one from a bad one or a, 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 a strong one? Uh, one's leading me the right way from one that's, that's not. How, how do I know? There, there's many dozens and dozens, if not well over 100 churches in our own county. How, how do I pick one? How do you know? Let's walk through this and see how this healthy church, what they did. We begin in, begin in verse number 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. In this great opening, he says, Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the first thing we see here in the opening is that grace always comes before peace. If you've never experienced the grace of God, you know nothing of the peace of God. And if you don't have the grace of God, you don't have the peace of God. No grace, no peace. But if you know the grace of God through Jesus Christ, then you can know the peace of God. And if you have the peace of God on your soul, it matters not what hell or high water may come. Because you are resting in who he is. You're resting in the salvation that's yours. Amen. And this world, whether, listen, whether it's a tsunami, whether it's sin, whether it's running out of gas, right? Uh, well, we don't know what's going to come day by day, but we can rest that if you have the grace of God, you have the peace of God. The first thing we find of the marks of a healthy church is verse number two. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Notice he dresses you all. Let me rephrase that. Y'all, okay? Uh, you get that. Living in southern Ohio, not far from Kentucky and West Virginia, you know. And I don't have to try too much. I already got a little bit of that in my blood. So, so y'all, he's addressing and he says, look, the first thing a healthy church will do will be a, a praying church, right? Uh, a church, we, we referenced this last Sunday. So this is just by way of review. It's going to be a people that are praying. Well, why do we need to pray? Because God is all-powerful. God is in control. We can cast all of our care upon Him. We don't have to go through life alone. We are, ought to be a praying church. 
Samuel said it's a sin that we not pray for one another. We should weep with those that weep, rejoice with those that rejoice, cast all of our care upon the Lord, and bear those burdens together. A local church that's healthy is going to be a praying church. You have a need, we want to pray for you. However we can. We love you. We want to pray for you. And we need to be a church, if we're going to be healthy, that's praying. Paul says in verse 17 of chapter 5, pray without ceasing. Secondly, we said last time we need to be a people of gratitude. Verse number 2 and 3 says, we give thanks to God always for y'all. Verse number 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope and our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. It was a people of gratitude. Paul was thankful for them. And I think it was not merely that Paul was grateful. I believe that they had a spirit of gratitude amongst them. And so we need to be a church that's thankful. You know, this is something that's going to stand out in this day and age. You, you know how few people are grateful? And we really don't know how good we got it until it's all gone. You know how much you appreciate gas so you can't find it, right? You see that little yellow bag over top of the thing? You say, oh, no, I'm in trouble. What am I going to do now? I can't be refined in my home, right? And, and some of these places I heard the gas went $6, $7, some places even more than that. I mean, that, that'd be a sight, wouldn't it? Listen, we, we don't realize how grateful uh, or how lacking gratitude we are until we don't have some of these things. Listen, if you've never had the blessing of traveling to a third world country, you really don't know how blessed you are. I, I hear Americans complain about things. I say, you have no concept. You have no concept. You don't know what it's like to really, realistically, probably go without. You've got clothes on your back, a roof over your head. You've got food, more food than you ever know what to do with. You go to some of these places where they don't have those kind of things, and you will not be ungrateful very long. You see people who are starving and hungry and thirsting and have no shelter over top of themselves and living impoverished. Some of these places around the world live on one, two, three dollars a day. You realize if you have just a modest income in America, you find yourself in the top one percent of all income earners in the entire world. We criticize the one percenters in America, but we are the one percenters in the context of the entire world. Let's not be ungrateful. And when it comes to you and I who are in Jesus Christ, we need to be of all people most grateful. What does it say to the world who say, yes, you have Jesus, but then you're ungrateful? That ought not be so. Amen, brethren? We ought to be grateful for the things that God's done. And Paul says, I'm grateful for you. Why? Verse 3 says, because you have a faith that works. It's a genuine faith. You're truly converted. You don't just say you're a believer. You show you're a believer by how you behave your life. You have a faith that works. He says you have a, le- a laboring love. You have deeds that are done. You carry out this work. It's exertion. It's love. It's service. And you do it out of love for the Lord and for one another. And then you have a patience of hope. Persevering of the hope. What is this hope? The confident expectation that the Lord is coming. And so you have a past faith that's real. That continues to labor in love in the present. And you look ahead to the future and say, Oh, the Lord Jesus is coming for me. I have these promises that are mine. And today we see number three. Not only a people of prayer, a people of gratitude. But number three, we need to be people that trust in the sovereignty of God. Trusting in the sovereignty of God. Verse number four says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. They were beloved. They were brethren. They were true believers. They were assured of their salvation. They were confident in this. They were the called and chosen and saved by God. We can rest today that God is in control. That God's ways and thoughts are higher than our ways and thoughts. Let me just say to you today, we need to know that God is in control. He is in control. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 says, For my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways and thoughts are higher than your ways and thoughts, as the mountains are higher than where you are. Listen, my friend, we recognize today that God's ways and thoughts are so much higher and nobler than our ways and thoughts. Things that we can't fully comprehend. We see the present view. He sees the big picture. And he sees it all at the same time. Right? He, he sees everything, and he's, he's working all things out providentially for the end game. Let me share a few verses just to remind you that God is in control. And we need to have a proper view of who he is. Psalm 115 and verse number 3. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. You continue on. The next passage there says in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 25, For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. You read down in 
In Psalm 135, verse number 6, it says, Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. Isaiah 46, in verse number 10, Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Daniel 4.35, when Nebuchadnezzar thought he was in control, God reminded him that he was not. He was the most powerful man on the face of the earth, and God said to him in Daniel 4.35 through Daniel, he says, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will, and the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth None can say his hand or can say unto him, What doest thou? Ephesians 1.11 reminds us here also, dear friend, it says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Let me remind you today, God is in control. We think that the powers in the White House, we think the people in Europe, we think the United Nations, we think the other people have the power. We think the businessmen in our world that are pulling the strings, that have built great wealth and uh, uh, great businesses and amassed power. They, we think they're the ones that are really calling the shots. Let me remind you of something. God is in the heavens. He is on his throne and he's not sharing that authority with anyone else. A.W. Tozer said it well. While it looks like things are out of control behind the scenes, there is a God who hasn't surrendered his authority. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You are a holy God. You are in control. Listen, let me say to you today, you need to have the right perspective of God. You know what what the problem is with our world today? I'll tell you in part what our problem is. There's a lot of things. But one of the big things is is we have a a, a low view of God. We we bring God down to our level. In other words, as, as Romans 3 tells us, there is no fear of God before their eyes. The world doesn't fear God. And when there's no reverence and awe and fear of God, then mankind run into sin. And men do evil because there's no fear. They don't, they don't fear God any more than they would grandma who has no teeth. Right? They, they're not fearful of God. They have, no, they have no concern that God could swoop down in a moment and suck the breath out of their lungs. They have no fear that God could call them out in a moment and instantaneously bring them into his very presence and have them be accountable for the way that they're living their lives. They have no fear of God. They're like Belshazzar who thought he was in control only to find out very clearly in Daniel 5, verse number 23, that the God in whose hand thy breath is and whose are all thy ways hast thou not glorified. God holds your very breath in his hands and our world needs to remember something. We are not in control. God is. God is on the throne. For too many, they look at God as the little G God. He just one of many gods. Listen, if you have a little G God, you have a big problem. You need to have a big G. OD. You need to have the right perspective of who God is. We consider a world where God is sovereign and in control, and some bristle at this, and yet consider a world where He's not in control. What would that look like? So I don't like the thought of God being in control. I don't like the fact that God may be funneling all things, and it looks like all things are spiraling out of control. We've read the back of the book, and we know that actually, as Christians, all things are working to this final end. And things are going to look more chaotic from a world's perspective, but we know in the grand scheme of things, it's not out of control at all. They made sure of their election and calling. They received Christ. They persevered. They were growing. They were saved, and they were assured of their salvation. They were beloved, and they were brethren. I ask you today, are you saved? If you're going to face this world, you need to know the Lord Jesus Christ. John 5, verse number 40, reminds us of that. Why won't people get saved? Why don't they come to God? John 5, 40 says, and you will not come to me that you might have life. Jesus made it very clear. Why don't people get saved? Say, well, do we just need a better presentation? Well, that may be at times we need to have a more clear understanding of the Scripture. But so oftentimes when you preach and you preach and you preach and you witness and you witness and you witness and you share the gospel with people and they don't want to get saved, you're beating yourself up and say, what more could I do? Listen, it's a matter of their will. They will not come to him. If they came to him, they would have life. So how do I know what's the difference between election and and free will? How does this all work? I don't understand. This is a thing outside of my understanding. God is in control. God calls. God saves. God elects. But we also understand that God is not going to turn anyone away that does come to him. And the reason they don't come to him is they will not come. It's a matter of the will. You can beat yourself up, but just keep praying and keep preaching. John 6.37 reminds us, as Jesus says it very clearly, 
By contrast, all that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. Listen, come. He's calling you, come. And all that God's given, come, will come. But, and it goes on to say, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You say, well, am I called of God? Am I elected of God? Come. Am I not elected? Come. Whosoever will, let them come and take the water of life freely. Come. God is not willing that any should perish. God will not have any man to die and go to hell. Listen, God doesn't want for that. He will have all men, 1 Timothy 2, verse number 4, to be saved. God longs for you to be saved. God wants you to be saved. We have to rest that God is outside of time. God is outside of our universe. God is bigger than all this, and He's in control. You ever stop thinking about how little we trust God? I shared an illustration in Sunday school class about that. The illustration was essentially this. this a senior lady was had all these concerns, you know, real and imagined. And she had done all she could, and the family had done all they could, and they basically left off with, well, we've done all we can, and now we're just going to have to trust God. And she said, has it really come to that? You know, it shouldn't have to come to that. It should begin with that, amen? We should begin with God is in control. God is a God that's all-powerful. God is a God that's all-knowing. And God who gave His Son, Jesus Christ, for me, I can trust my life, my future, my eternity with Him. Oh, my friend, we need to have a high, elevated view of God. What should you look for in a church? You should have a church that has a healthy elevated, esteemed view of God. Listen to what Isaiah said in Isaiah 6, 1-5. Isaiah 6, 1-5 tells us about Isaiah's view of God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting up on the throne. Notice, God was on the throne. Not Bill Gates, not Jeff Bezos, not Donald Trump, not Joe Biden, not you, not me, not anyone else, not any athlete or icon. Listen, God was on the throne, and God was high, and God was lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Verse number 2. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. And with twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet in reverence. And with twain he did fly. Notice what they were declaring in verse number 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse number 4. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. The, you can just see the place shaking. And Isaiah, Isaiah was the holiest man in Israel, the prophet, who ended up giving his life for the cause. They put him in a log, they sawed him in two. That's how devoted he was. And this holy man of Israel said this, When I saw the vision of God, this is how I responded. Then said I, Woe, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You know what our world says today? Judge not. We live our lives, we puff ourselves up, we bring God down low, we put God as an equal, not as a superior, and we elevate ourselves and we elevate all of our decisions and we say, sin's not so bad because we're looking at one another, but God, oh dear friend, God isn't comparing you to me or me to you. God is comparing you to himself. And when you get the proper view of God, when a church has a healthy view of God, they'll see God high and lifted up on the throne, declaring holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And when you see God as you ought to, you know what you will do? You will fall down before him and not say, let me live more of my sin. Let me compromise. Let's see what I can get away with. No, you don't have a right view of God. When you have a right view of God, you're not going to be excusing your sin. You're going to be running from your sin. And you're going to be falling down like Isaiah and saying, Woe is me! I am undone. I am unclean. My lips are filthy. I dwell among people that are filthy. And we won't be vaunting our sin on Main Street. We'll be weeping over our sin at the altars. What's wrong with churches today? Nobody wants to talk about God, a God that's high and lifted up. Nobody wants to talk about God on the throne anymore. Why? Because it makes us recognize that we are sinners before a holy God. We don't want to face it. We don't want to deal with our sin. So what do we do? We acquiesce. We go to the churches that never talk about sin. Never talk about judgment. Never talk about God being holy. 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 
If the most holy man in Israel could fall before God and say, God, my eyes have seen something I can't even describe. Take my life away. It's too much for me. Who are we to live higher than that? If he humbled himself in brokenness, how can we vaunt ourselves in pride? How many times do people go to church and they have no estimation for the holiness of God? God is brought down. And we say, I'm going to get to heaven. I'm going to break dance with Jesus. I'm going to high five with him. I'm going to bear hug Jesus. He's a friend of sinners and I'm the chief of them. We're all sinners. But we should never boast that we're sinners. Why boast of what cost him his life? Why boast of what God, cost God sending his son to die for us? Oh, you want a healthy church? Find a church that has a great reverence for God. Number four. Number one is a church needs to be healthy. It's going to be a people of prayer, a people of gratitude, trusting the sovereignty of God. And number four, where the church is healthy, it's going to be a place where the word of God is the final authority. The final authority. Notice in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse number 5. Verse number 5 says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Ghost. The gospel came unto them in word. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse number 13 goes on to say, furthermore, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in deed, the very, or truth, the very word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Paul came to them, declaring unto them the word of God, the gospel, eight times in the two letters, Six times in the first letter of Thessalonians, he speaks of the gospel, the good news. He brings unto them the word of God. This word is the final authority. It's where the butt stops here, as we say that, right? The butt stops here. It stops with the word of God. This is the final authority. First Peter 1 verse 25 says it's an enduring word. But the word of the Lord endureth how long? Uh, up until the 19th century? No, no, forever. It's, well, it's just, it's so outdated, Pastor. Don't you realize, you're like a dinosaur. You're soon to be like the United States Postal Service. You're going to be a thing of the past. And churches that, that, that want to preach the whole counsel of God's word, they are so outdated and they are so offensive to this culture. Can I, can I ask you one question? Has the world ever considered, not how offensive the word of God is to them, but just how offensive they are to God? Are the preachers that spineless? Are they so much like a bag of applesauce that they can't stand up and declare, thus saith the Lord? You see, the problem today is this, is no one wants to face the facts that God is holy and we are anything but holy. We are depraved at our core nature. We go astray. You're sitting here today. You come in, you know, right? We're sinful people. And so many times we come into churches and we never hear of the holiness of God. We never get confronted with our sin because we don't want to be confronted. And so many churches will never, never cause an issue. Why? Because they want to keep you coming. They want to keep more people in the church down the street. Can I say to you, a church that really is being honest and true and really cares about your soul will give you the word of God regardless if one person shows up or a thousand people show up. The word of God must be the final authority. Isaiah 40, verse number 8, reminds us of this. Notice it says in Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Matthew 5, and verse number 18, Not one jot or one tittle will fall away. Till all are fulfilled, every stroke, every apostrophe will be fulfilled. The Word of God is final. A healthy church will have the Bible as its final authority. Thus saith the Lord, and that's it. They're, they're not dependent upon a denomination. They're not, they're, they're not making their decisions based upon a board or a hierarchy or some high-powered family in the church or a, ma a majority of the church. Rather, just like a big poll here today and see what the church wants. We don't make decisions based upon a, what will draw a crowd or what lines up with a certain political purpose or platform, not what lines up with the hot button issue of the day of social justice or trying to pacify people the way they are. No, no, no. Thus saith the Lord. Whatever he says, we have to settle with that. You say, well, I don't like that. We don't get a choice on the matter. 
And if you want to reject the word of God, you're rejecting the God of that authority. So I'm not your issue today. You're, you're bristling under me. I'm not your issue. It's him. We find in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 2 to 6, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Can I say, when, when preachers and missionaries begin truly preaching the true gospel, it will bring contention. It will tick people off. You say, well, you offended somebody. Well, you know what the reality is? It's high time sinners like you and I are offended sometimes. You ever stop thinking about how offended God is every single moment of his existence? And how sad it is for people to stand in the pulpit and become prostitutes of the gospel and not call people on their sin and not turn them to Jesus Christ away from their sin and turn them unto him. It will bring contention. So I heard a lot of contention was going on over there. Well, maybe they're doing something right. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men. Don't get me started. But with God which trieth our hearts, for neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetous God is witness. They didn't use flattering words. They weren't people pleasers. They were proclaiming the high authority of scriptures the high word of god the word of god was final it was the authority those that have a high view of the scriptures i ask you what church are you a part of does it have a high view of scripture a healthy church will esteem the word of god psalm 138 and, and verse number two he says i will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth why god says for thou has magnified thy word Above all thy name. How high and holy is God's name? He says, I magnify my word above my name. Isaiah 66, verse number 2, goes on to describe it further, and it says this. For all those things hath mine hand made. Are you listening to me today? And all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look. What person does God look for? What church does God look for? To him that is poor and of a contrite spirit. And what does it say in the next part of verse number 2? And he that trembleth at my word. Notice the next part of that slide there. And trembleth at my word. You want to know what the problem is today? No one trembles before the word of God. We see this book as, oh, well, grandma means well. It's not really pertinent for today. Do you realize that one day this book's going to be open and your eternity is going to be judged according to it? Let me say, if I'm going to stand before God and God's going to open the book and this is one of them, I want to know what it has to say. You may not care, I do care. I want to know what it's got to say. Because my life is going to be lined up next to it. And Jesus said in John 12, 48, He that rejecteth my words and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I've spoken shall judge you in the last day. Let me say to you today, my friend, we need to have a trembling view of God. Can I say to you, so little is made of reverence for God's word. So little of the time do we hold it in high view. The word of God is what saves a soul, 1 Peter 1, 23. It's the incorruptible word. It's the word of God that not only saves, it's the word of God that sanctifies a church that's concerned for you, a healthy church is going to seek to proclaim the gospel to see you saved from hell. People always say, well, I'm saved. Well, what, what, what are you saved from? Well, uh, I'm saved from a purpose, purposeless life. No, you're saved from hell because you and I are sinners. We're saved from the wrath of God. And Jesus has done the work. And then once you get saved, a church that's truly concerned with you will want to see you sanctified. What does this mean? Perfect? No. Progressing toward Christ. Christ's likeness, the word sanctified, consecrated, comes from this thought of holy and saint. God's trying to make you like Jesus, conform you to the image of Christ. Christ's likeness is what holiness looks like. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse number 12 says that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. A church that loves the Lord. His word and obeys the Lord and His commandments. And many, arguably, the majority of churches today, the word of God is not the authority. It is not supreme. You know what is so sad today in so many churches is? It's not what God's word says that goes. It's what the people want is what goes. It's what people want that goes. You know what marketing is? 
Any business, any, 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 any industry that's trying to sell some goods, marketing is essentially trying to say, whatever the consumer wants, give it to them. Ask the least thing from them, take away any thing that's going to catch wind, and give the consumer what they want. Keep them happy. Well, the problem today is that's filtered into the churches. And so, so churches and preachers, and church, they, they, they've come to the place where let's drop all asks. Let's never offend anybody. Let's make it as convenient and comfortable for the consumer. Let me just ask you one thing. Is this the people's church or Christ's church? You see, the Bible I read says that Christ is the head of the church. Christ gave his blood for the church, and it's his church. And until it becomes the people's church, we're going to keep doing what Christ wants us to do with the church. We're not given the ability to say, well, what would you like? What will make you happy? No, we say, what does God's word declare? And so now you have churches that are what? They're given to whatever the consumer wants. And so many churches today look just like a bar scene. You go to the bar on Saturday night, you come to the church house on Sunday morning, and I'm not trying to make too much of ambiance, but I'm just here to tell you, it says something that you can walk into a bar and you can walk into a church and you say, well, it all feels the same. And I don't really get judged either place. I don't have my sin ever called out. I don't ever get anyone pointing me to Jesus Christ. I don't ever have anyone really talking about a hell that i got to face one day or a God that I'm going to be accountable to. Think about the marketing that goes on today. And I ask you one question. If the truth remains, let's strip everything away. Let's take away the light show. Let's take away the smoke and the fog. Let's take away the rock concert. Let's take away the cutesy videos. And the person that's like trying to dress half their age and clothes they ought not wear even at home. Let's stop the entertainment Let's come down to four walls, four white walls and a couple light bulbs. Let's sit down together and open God's Word and see how many people show up in two weeks. And if you can't worship when there's no ambiance and no entertainment and no consumer mindset first, and it's all about Jesus and all about His Word and all about the truth and salvation and sanctification, I ask you, what is really going on there? What's propping it up? Clip the stilts and see what remains. Truth will remain. The person who really loves the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't need the props because they love Jesus regardless. And unless you understand this differently, come with me down to a place like Haiti. And in Haiti, we went out. We flew down to the Port au Prince. We drove out a couple hours. I was sick, stuffed in the back of a, a van that should have held about eight people, about 20 people in there. I'm, I'm crunched up against the wall like this, and I'm like getting claustrophobic, and i just about ready to... Ow, you know, I can't stand it anymore. It's hot, the air conditioning. It didn't even matter if it was on because it wasn't doing anything. You're sweating profusely. You're hot as can be. I'm not in hell, but I sure felt as close as it could possibly be. I was the most uncomfortable I could ever be. I like, what in the world are we doing? We're driving out in the tin buck till we stop at this dirt road. We just get out. Like, where are we going? I don't see any buildings. All oh, the church is over here. All oh, the church is over here? Yeah. We all pile out. People come from I don't know where. I don't know where they came from. There were four wooden logs. There were, there were old like tarps. Like, you know, you, you go to Lowe's, you buy a bunch of lumber. You go to Menards, you buy a bunch of lumber. And the, and the, and the thing that covers them from the weather, that they just had these tarps up on the walls and over top. And then you walk inside and they're preparing to have the Lord's table and they got these crude looking wooden benches and you sit up on them and there's no support for your back. There's no low, lower lumbar support. And the only air you're getting was if one of those little tent things were flapping open. And I walk in there and these people are singing out to Jesus and loving Jesus and loving one another. I ask you, you drop the American church in that environment and you tell me how many people are going to show up next Sunday. And do they have Jesus or do they have entertainment? I say to you today, my friend, if our heart isn't to serve Jesus, if it's hard or easy, we've got to really check ourselves. Check ourselves, dear friend. We find fifthly and finally, I won't get through all this, I know. I was about to get heated here. Number five. A Bible preaching, gospel proclaiming church. Fifth and finally, this last thing today is in verse number five. If a church is going to be what it needs to be, it needs to be a Bible preaching church. A gospel proclaiming church. 
A place where the word of God is preached, where the gospel is declared. It says in verse 5, our gospel came not into you in a word only. 1 Thessalonians 2, as we said, verse 2 down to verse number 6, they declared the word of God in boldness. The gospel, they were not speaking flattering words. They were not pleasing men. They were declaring the whole truth of God's word. Verse number 13, they declared the word of God as it was to people as they were. Acts 17, 2 and 3, what did Paul do when he came to Thessalonica? He reasoned with them out of the scripture. He comes to Thessalonica, he reasons with them in the synagogue, out of the scriptures, he opens and alleges the scriptures. Can I say to you today, my friend, if you go to a church and they don't have you to bring your Bible, the pastor doesn't bring the Bible, you're not encouraged to open the Bible, read the Bible, you need to find a new church. I'm not saying you got to come here. But go somewhere where they encourage you to bring the Bible. Open the Bible. Read the Bible. When Paul went and they were founding this church, he opened the Scriptures. He used the Scriptures. His authority in founding a church, having a healthy church, was not in his intellect, his reason, his innovation, his business model, his personal charm, his charisma, his persuasiveness. His power was in the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice Acts 17, 2 and 3. He opened the scriptures. He opened it. Let me just say to you, let me encourage you to bring your Bible here, okay? Many of you do, and I know we put them up on the screen, probably done you a disservice over the last 15 years by doing that. But bring your Bible to church. Read your Bible. Open your Bible. Listen, the Word of God must be central. So many churches today... You may go to church and you hear a little ditty. Maybe they open the scriptures. Maybe they read the scriptures. Maybe they read some liturgy. Maybe they talk about what went on this last week. Maybe they tell stories the whole time. Maybe they read three words out of one verse and then they make some big cutesy 20-minute sermonette out of something else. Listen, it's the Word of God that saves. The Word of God that transforms. If you go to a church where the preacher doesn't have a Bible, leave. Don't wait till the end of service. You say, well, that might be rude. Well, maybe he'll get the message. Maybe he'll get the message. Why'd you leave? Because you didn't bring the Bible. Why'd you leave? Because we were 20 minutes into your sermon and you hadn't even cracked the Bible open. Let's go back to the former point. What's the final authority? Is it Ryan Bevan? No, it's not Ryan Bevan. Is it the church? No, it's not the church. Is it the denomination? No, it's not the denomination. Is it the stupid video that you're showing people? No, it's not the video. It's the Word of God. Dear friend, it's high time we get back to thus saith the Lord. So many take little bits here and there, and oftentimes out of context. Oh, dear friend, we need a mark of a healthy church as a Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching church. We need more of the Word of God, not less. We need less of what people say and more of what He says. Less of what thus saith Joel and more of thus saith Jesus. Less of what the hip, cool, wannabe 20 again fitting in with the world type motivational, conversational speaker has to say who's just there to tickle your ears with sweet, nothing's carnal approaches and catchy videos. We need more of what the God of the universe inspired holy men of old to write down and preserve and all generations to read and live thereby. What's happened to our world? We've lost our moral equilibrium. We need recalibrated. Our gauges are off. Most of the degeneration of our day and time has come because the house of God has lost its power. The word of God has been lost, lost in pulpits, lost in churches, left behind in people's lives, left out of their marriages, out of their parents, forsaken in their homes. We concern ourselves too often with entertaining ourselves and entertaining one another just to get a bigger audience, bigger than the next church, keep people coming, paying, giving lip service. What a joke! We need to get back to the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. You know when they had been in uh, 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 captivity and they come back into the land and Nehemiah had just rebuilt and they said, look, we got to start this thing right. They called Ezra. You know why they called Ezra in Ezra 7 verse 6? He was a ready scribe. This meant he was a lawyer. He knew the word. He knew the law. He could articulate the book. He wasn't up on all the sports. He wasn't up on all the entertainment. He can tell you about every R-rated movie out there. He can tell you what the Word of God said. He prepared Ezra 7, 10, his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. We pick up in Nehemiah chapter 8, and I'm almost done. Believe me, I am. 
But Nehemiah chapter 8, we read these words. Go back there, Nehemiah 8, verse 1 to 12. Let's just read, scan through this. What did Ezra do as a ready scribe to these people who had been in captivity, been in bondage, been in what we have been living through in this nation? It was high time that they came back to the Lord, came back to His law, came back to the authority. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both the men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until the midday. They read from morning till midday. I'm doing you a disservice. Before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood up on a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood all these different ones. Verse number 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. They didn't just stand up when they read it. They stood up the whole time, which went on for hours. Maybe we should have been standing this whole time, so you wouldn't be sleeping. And Ezra blessed the people, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Verse 7 goes on to say, These group of teachers caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. Verse 8, So they read in the book and the law distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah stood up, and they taught the people, and the people began to weep. They heard the words of the law, and he said this was a day of joy and of blessing. And he goes on to say in verse 11, hold your peace in verse 12, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Why were these people going to revive and rebuild right? Because they went back to the truth. They went back to the foundation. They had built on the sand before. Now they're going to build on the rock. How did that come? Here's what happened. He said this, we want to get back? When you get back, bring the book. Bring the book. It's high time we've left the book behind. Bring the book. And then he said, open the book. And when you open the book, it says there that they stood up. They reverenced the book. It wasn't some foolish waste of time, of entertainment. No, they made a pulpit. They elevated the preaching and the teaching and the reading of God's Word. They didn't make less of it, shorter time of it. They elevated it above the rest. They read the book. They heard the book. They taught the book. They understood the book. They applied the book. They obeyed the book. And they were blessed by the book. They began to weep. Thursday night, I got asked to go preach at a missions uh, conference, uh, Hillsborough Bible Baptist Church. And while I was there, it was the final session. It had been going on all day. Uh, final session, and they asked Josh Bevan, my brother, younger brother, bigger brother, to preach and me to preach. I said, wait a minute. You want both of us to preach the same service? They said, yeah. They said, you each get 20 minutes. I said, 20 minutes? They said, yeah, just share your testimony, then you can preach for 20 minutes. I said, 20 minutes? So I'm struggling. Like, hey, what are you going to do in 20 minutes? I can't even get worked up to an appetite in 20 minutes, you know? Like, we, we got to do something. There ain't no way you're going to get anything done in 20 minutes. Well, then the problem is I'm realizing it's Josh and I. And you think, man, you are the longest preacher I've ever heard, and I can't wait till the final amen. He's longer. He's absolutely longer. If you don't believe me, you've not heard him, and he'll be back here one of these days. So they said, well, who's going to go first? We want you to go uh, let him go first since he's younger, and then you close out. I said, no, no, no. If I have any say in this, I'll do whatever you want. But if I have any say in this, I would like to go first. So why would you want to go first? You're older. I said, well, here's the reason. Number one, he's a better preacher than me, so I don't want to go after him. You don't have to obey Ruth, right? You just don't do that, right? So I want to go first. I'm forgettable. He's, he's not. And uh, so I'll go first. And then age-wise, I'm older. And chronologically, he came to help us start the church. We had eight people. He's one of the eight. He and Candace. And then they went out of here uh, in 2009, started the church in Lighthouse Baptist Church in Xenia. So chronologically, it would make sense that we're sharing our testimony. And then the third reason I didn't make a big deal about until I got up there. I said, if I preach last, I won't have any time to preach. If I got 20 and he's got 20, he's going to preach 40 and I'm going to say amen. You know what I mean? And so... Problem was, so it got down to the moment where I was about to preach, 
And uh, the, the choir, there was a, a, about 50 people in they, they, Marietta Bible College. They got uh, a, a missionary church planner from all over the globe, Filipinos, uh, Asian, African countries. And it's just amazing. They were up there just singing. As soon as they got done, I didn't know it was my time. He said, hey, you're up. I was like, oh, okay. So I, I, I got up there. And as I got up there, the, they didn't have a pulpit like this because the choir was standing there. And so I had to find a music stand to preach off of. And, and, and so as I'm standing there, I couldn't find their clock. I couldn't, you know, I don't know how hard I was looking, but I couldn't find it, you know? And then when I'm standing up there, all the people right here, so it would be kind of awkward going, okay? So I practiced this. I thought, well, I can do this in 20 minutes. I did it in 20 minutes several times as I was preparing for tonight. Well, the problem was I got up there and started preaching, and everybody's like, amen, you know? Preach it, you know? I'm like, ooh, yeah, you like feeding the bulldog, you know? And I'm just like eating it all up. I get done preaching. I sit down. I look down at my watch. I preach 40 minutes. And then Josh had to get up. <laughs> he preached 25 minutes. These people have well over an hour of preaching. Me, and then they're like, bring in the closer, and here he comes. All I say is, it did go long, but I'll say this. When the invitation was given, people came to the altar, and I went down the altar, and I was praying. As I was sitting there praying at the altar, I heard somebody come, and they were beside me there, and I heard them begin to weep. They began to weep. I don't just mean a few little sniffles. I mean, they were weeping. And I, and I just sat for a while. I was trying to pray, but I just lost my concentration because to hear someone weeping. And, and I, the pastor in me, I said, maybe someone here needs a pastor to pray with or something. So I'm sitting there, and I'm praying. And as I, as I r- r- raise up and I just kind of glance over, I notice it was a young lady. She was one of the Filipinos that was at the college, and she was, she was weeping before God. Tears were rolling down her face, and she was crying out to God. I looked all the, down the altar, and people were just flooded down the altar, and she's just weeping. I thought, man, this is what we've lost in the church in America today. Nobody weeps over their sin. We laugh about it. We compromise about it. You go to most churches, you don't ever hear the word sin, judgment, hell, repentance ever brought up. We come in filthy. We leave out filthy, and we expect the work of God to happen. God says, I have none of it. None of it. There aren't healthy churches today because no one wants to hear, Thus saith the Lord. We laugh about our sin. We make light of it. We joke about it. We're all sinners. No one's perfect. No. Jesus died for every sin. We don't need to make a mockery of it. You want to know why some places around the world are seeing revival and we are dead churches many times? Because we don't come to the altar and weep over our sin and weep that God would use us and have a humility and an honesty and a brokenness before God. Would you stand with me? As you stand and bow your heads and close your eyes, I'm just going to stop right there. I've said enough. Dear friend, we read God's word. It's a final authority, but do we really believe it? And if we really believe it, will we not magnify it above his name? If we really believed it, will we not tremble before it? How do we fall asleep before it? How do some of you come in here and you know you're as filthy as everything? You're you're filthy right now. And you're just standing there and you don't believe that the God of heaven sees what you're doing. You have no no real consideration that you're going to stand before him one day. And you're going to continue living a filthy life. And you're going to justify it because, because no one calls you out on it. You think nobody knows about it. God knows about it. Am I filthy? There's many times I am, but i got to seek the Lord's face and keep that leash short and not run away from Him. There's times we've got to fall on our face before God continually and say, oh, you are high and you are noble and you are lofty and you are lifted up. God, forgive me for bringing you down to my level. Today, my friend, you need to be saved. Would you come? Say, Pastor Ron, I don't know that I'm saved. I'm not going to ask you, are you a good person? I'm saying, do you know for sure if you die today, you go to heaven? And if you don't know for sure, would you raise your hand? You say, I don't know that I'm saved. I want to invite you today to come. And maybe today as a Christian, God's dealt in your heart. And you're away from the Lord. Where are you at? What are you doing? Why are you wasting and squandering your life away with lesser things? Today, my friend, today's the day. The church can't be what it needs to be if the people in the church aren't what they ought to be. So many of you are doing so well. And let me commend you. We're not perfect, but we're progressing. Let's keep progressing. But if you're here today and you're not saved, would you come? Maybe today as a Christian, God's dealt in your heart, would you come?
Lord, bless this invitation time. May your will be done in every life. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you come today as we sing of, Lord, I'm coming home. Listen, you come home. Come home to him. He's here. We love you. God loves you. He'll save you today. Whatever it is, my friend, you come and be honest and humble before the Lord. You may have wandered one step or a thousand, but today you start with that first step back home. As others come today, would you come? Would you come today? If you're not sure that you're saved, balcony or main floor, we invite you to come. You need to come for any reason today. Would you come? Would you come? Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've tried. Lord, I'm coming home. Coming coming home never more to roam open now thine arms of love Lord I'm coming home I've tired of sin Straying, Lord, now I'm coming home. I'll trust Thy love, believe Thy word, Lord. I'm coming home. Coming. Maybe something in your life that you need to confess or just bring it to God this morning to come. If you're not sure you're saved this morning, you have questions about what that means to be saved, there's still time to come. Don't hesitate. If you're afraid or you're embarrassed, to tap the friend next to you. They'll go with you. Make sure of your salvation. If you have things, something you need right with God, you come. Now's your time to come. Let's that next verse. My soul is sick, my heart is sore, now I'm coming home, my strength renew, my hope restore, Lord, I'm coming home, coming be seated at this time as we have a baptism.
All right, if you have your bulletin, go ahead and pull that out. We'll go over some announcements uh, this morning. And if you are visiting with us today, um, if you did not receive a visitor cup, we have some at the Welcome Center. Uh, and if you did get a cup, if you would take a moment to fill that out, you can either leave that on your seat or there's a basket out on the Welcome Center. And we appreciate you visiting with us today. If you have your bulletin, we just want to go over just a few announcements. Uh, tonight, after the evening service, we're going to have a time of volleyball. And so... <laughs> Josh is excited. You, you can always tell if Josh is here if he amens it. Uh, but it'll be tonight after the service, so that will be uh, following tonight. So make sure you uh, make plans for that if you're able to come. Uh, this week we'll be resuming the uh, midweek service with uh, Gospel of Luke, so come out for that. Saturday we'll have the outreach and visitation. And then next Sunday we're having our graduation Sunday. And so if you are graduating high school or college, we'll be recognizing those seniors and graduates next Sunday. And then also with that, the uh, Sunday school classes will be moving up to the next class. So that will be next Sunday. So make sure you take note of that as well. Uh, also, we have the VBS workers meeting following the evening service next week. So if you would like to help out with a vacation Bible school, you can come to that meeting next Sunday night after the evening service. And that would be a time for that. Or if you have questions, if you can't make it, make sure you see Hannah Stotridge for that. If I can ask the ushers come this morning as we receive the offering. Uh, we have a few other things coming up uh, in the coming months. We have our uh, high school and junior high camp called, called The Stand. That's going to be at Fuel Camp, Camp Chautauqua, and that's for 7th through 12th grade. And then we also have junior camp coming up in July for Splash Camp. So make sure you take note of those dates and the details that are in the bulletin. And so let's go ahead and pray for the offering today. If I can ask Gavin Anderson if you pray for us. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. I want to dismiss the uh, service with a word of prayer. If I can ask uh, Gabe Stocking up in the balcony if you pray for us today.